स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया In this module, we will be looking at lighting. So far, we have been talking about thermal as well as acoustics. In this, you know, further modules, this and the next module, we will be looking at lighting. This specific module will cover indices of measurement. What is lighting? What is light energy? What are the indices? Primarily, what units they have, and what is essential? We will talk little bit about daylighting. how to calculate it primarily about estimating daylighting in the following module we will look at daylight harvesting system and how they can be incorporated in the design light is a part of electromagnetic spectrum it is a visible portion this is the only thing human eyes can see so it ranges from around 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers below that you have infrared and the other side you have ultraviolets so we are interested in the lighting that is a visible part of the light i mean visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum as far this module is concerned let us look at few important indices that you have to really understand a lot of them are used and sometimes they are used in place of one is used in place of the other they are often confused indices let us take a look at few commonly used indices first is light power any particular energy you talk about we have to talk about the source the light power talks about the source it is the amount of energy or light emitted from a source which is kind of you know if you compare it with the water flowing in a pipe the diameter of the pipe decides how much amount of water can flow through it so this is more or less equivalent to that we call it light power it is measured in lumens the unit for measurement of light power is lumens it is something like luminous flux typically when we say energy flow we talk about flux so this is luminous flux it is measured in lumens typically luminous flux is the rate at which as we said the light energy flows from the source one lumen is the light flow emitted by a unit intensity we will look at what is light intensity in the following slide let us just say it is a unit intensity of point source now we are talking about a point source with a unit solid angle as we all know surface of the sphere a sphere subtends 4 pi unit solid angle at its center so there is a 4 pi if you say one candle or unit intensity point source we will define intensity shortly unit intensity point source will be emitting 12.56 12.6 or 12.64 pi lumens in all directions this is the conversion which goes here let us take a look at what is light intensity this is measured in candela if you divide the luminous flux that you know we defined as f which is a luminous flux if you dif you know divide it with the solid angle that is omega which we are defining as omega if you divide this the quotient what you get is the intensity of light source this is measured in candela as i said luminous intensity you can compare it with the flow intensity through a particular channel so if you are relating an analogy with light as well as this pipe we will be comparing this for a few more instances for a better understanding first we talked about luminous flux once you divide luminous flux by the solid angle then you get the luminous intensity this is measured in candela now let us look at two indices which are more commonly used or any of the standards you refer to they will at some point refer or specify the amount of light required or the kind of lighting required in terms of these indices the first thing we should know is luminance illuminance level sorry it is illuminance level you will know something like lux levels people will talk you know about lux levels this is a required amount of lux level lux is a unit or you know in the older system it used to be called as foot candle it is something like you are collecting water in a tray from the same water flow channel so this is like the amount of light falling over a surface or amount of water in this analogy which is collected over a surface holder as i said it is lumens per square meter that is flux per square meter or square feet in older units it used to be called as foot candle so in the similar way if you are having a plane in which the light energy is falling on so how much energy will fall how much lux you know uh, flux luminous flux will fall on a particular area so lumens per square meter area for example would be indicated as 
lux level. Lux is an indicator of lumens per square meter or lumens per square foot. As I said in older units, it is foot candle, it used to be called as. If you get the comparison, one foot candle, you can convert it to around 10.8 lux. If you say typical light sources, full moon, you will have close to 1 lux or pretty low light level. Simply, you know, Indian standards, for example, recommends around 300 lux for typical reading writing activities, say classroom lighting on your desk, on your table, students table, you should have around 250 to 300 lux. You can still see visualize things or objects if you have 80 lux to 100 lux, you will be able to clearly see objects, but for task specifically, here we are talking about task, there are two types of lights lighting which has to be provided typically, one is task lighting, another is a background or ambient lighting. In most places, we do not go for these two layers, at least minimum two layers are essential. Typically, we do not go for two layers, we are simply going with one background layer. So, when you say 300 lux, you try to increase the lighting level, so that you get 300 like lux on your desktop. So, if you have to really talk about the energy conscious design, then you will go actually go for two layers. For ambient lighting, you do not need 300 lux, you can still see as I said, see objects at 80 to 100 lux. So, you can probably stop somewhere around 100 to 150 lux threshold for your background lighting. This is a background layer. Then on your desktop, you will need somewhere close to 280 to 300 lux or slightly more in some cases, where for a clear, you know, or a strain free visibility and doing of the task that you are doing, reading and writing task. If you are doing some work in the computer, typewriting, it may not require 300 lux, maybe it is slightly low. Talk about a surgical, you know, area where an operation theatre, some surgery is being performed, you need a very high lux level, you need close to 10,000 lux, that is very huge amount of lighting is required. Typically in recording, you know, video recording studios, they have something like flood lighting close to when people are playing in the night time, when you know day and night matches are happening, night time tournaments are happening, you have something called flood lighting, where very high light levels which is mimicking the daylight, more than 8000 lux, close to 10000 lux is provided. Plain sunshine, if you go out and measure, it will be close to 1 lakh lux you may get directly on this, you know, if you put a horizontal sen you know, sensor in a horizontal plane, you will be able to get as high as this. Similarly, example, if you are going to a workspace where something like a minute repair, say a hardware, small you know a fabrication is happening, instrument hardware fabrication is happening or a even simpler example is a watch repair shop, where very minute parts circuits are being repaired, in that you will naturally need higher lux level. So, in these cases typically we go for task lighting separately, whereas the ambient or background lighting separately. When you study lighting design in detail, Light, you know, lighting design is dealt with in terms of layering, we call layering principle. You take the example of a hotel, you enter the hotel, say imagine it is a 5 star hotel, you are entering it, you will have a reception area lobby, then you will have the reception desk, you will have some murals, artistic works, some you know statues, few artistic things will be there, some landscape will be seen outside, they will have certain areas you know lounges to discuss, then a canteen will be, you know cafeteria might be visible, lifts will be visible. So, for each of these particular tasks which are performed, reception desk, general visibility of the reception area itself plus lighting the murals or paintings, sign boards, each of these things will need a specific amount of lux level or lighting level, you know more technically lumens per meter square that is amount of light required on a particular surface. for a per, you know task or a particular object to be seen more clearly. You want a person to see a signboard more clearly, you may need slightly higher lux levels on that particular surface. This we call as layering principle. When we do artificial lighting design, we will be actually dealing with light levels in different layers. The next indicator which is very crucial is called luminance. Often it is confused with the previous one that is illuminance, that is the intensity of light, sorry the flux or the amount of light energy falling in a particular area. Here we are talking about luminance which is also referred as brightness. So, moment we say brightness, it is the amount of light perceived or measured to reflect of a surface. So, there are two things, one is a perception, how does your eye perceive the same light and how much amount of light the surface is reflecting back. Imagine there is 
500 lux which is falling on a white table surface versus the same 500 lux light which is incident or falling on a black painted matte black painted table surface. The brightness level in these two cases will be drastically different because two reasons one is your eye adaptation of course there is slight difference but even negating that you are the you know you are the same person is made to watch the same is judging the light levels then comes the reflectivity of the surfaces the first one was a bright white reflecting surface the second is a matte black surface so the surface reflectivity and absorptivity characteristics drastically affects the amount of light, light reflected off a particular surface. This particular thing is referred as brightness or luminance level which is measured as candela per meter square. The unit for measurement of luminance is candela per meter square. Lux levels or illuminance level you have very simple devices illuminance meters or lux meters they have a sensor you put them out they will be able to lock they are you know more inexpensive rather for you know you have a very easy way of measuring luminance level whereas when you want to measure luminance there are specific devices where you have to focus on a particular surface you have to set the surface properties then you focus it like a camera they are slightly pricey devices measuring which you will get what is a brightness level or luminance on a surface both these things are crucial many of the standards or many of the specifications will stop short of saying what is the brightness level required. Typically they say this is a lux level or illuminance level required on a particular surface. Many standards do not talk directly about brightness, but they talk about something called glare. Glare is resulting out of two, three typical phenomena. One is you have a focus, you have a background, you are looking at a task and you have a background. So when there is a difference between the brightness level of the task as well as the background, then you will uh, you know result in a phenomena called glare. The other thing is you have direct light incident on your eye, then you will incur the ph same phenomena called glare. There are different types, it is typically annoyance or the loss of clarity which happens, you cannot see or read, perform a particular activity with the same clarity or comfort which you will be, you should be able to do. With that phenomena we are referring as glare, there are two types of glare. One is discomfort glare, there is a disability glare. I can give you specific examples, two to three examples where you can really understand what will be a discomfort and disability glare. You are sitting in your classroom, you are looking at your writing board, say a blackboard. If you have the sides, both sides of the blackboard, if you have two windows where you have direct solar incidents where you have light from the sun falling on. Say if it is a east facing surface, you are looking at the board in the morning hour, say 8 o'clock you have a class. You have direct sun, there is this particular glazing surfaces which is not shaded in this case, no curtains. These two surfaces will be too bright. When you want to focus on your blackboard, you will be having certain visual discomfort. This is one example. Second is when you are driving, you have a sudden flood light which is interrupting you, somebody is putting on their headlights, they are you know putting on in a high beam. Then you have a phenomena which affects your visibility in a very short instance. It may be a fraction of second for which you lose your clarity of vision. The first thing is called discomfort glare where you are uncomfortable but still you are able to see the task and work on it. Whereas a sudden flash of light which very temporarily for a very short duration affects your visibility, we refer it as disability glare. Typically when you talk about glare, some of the specifications, say project specification will say you should follow national building code or this particular code where the lux level or the illuminance level is specified. Say for example, they are asking you to guarantee you have 300 lux on your tabletop. They will also say you should avoid glare, especially in workshops. For example, when you have a long yard, working yard, which has typically high truss roofs, then you provide north lights or few daylighting systems. One is you are trying to ensure with floodlights and daylight, you are trying to ensure you get the task lighting to the required amount. Say for example, you need around 800 to 900 lux for a particular task. So you are ensuring that. What happens is some of the locations, the light levels will be too high. 
so that the light versus the task versus the background, the contrast will be too high. We are talking about the contrast here. When the contrast is increasing beyond, that is a maximum lux level available versus the minimum lux level available, reflectance of the task surface versus reflectance of the background surface. If these things are drastically different, when the threshold is crossed, there will be a discomfort associated. This is also, you know, kind of classified as glare. In this case, it is primarily visual discomfort we are talking about. Some of the standards will require you to work around and ensure the glare or visual discomfort is avoided. In these cases, you will need both illuminance level as well as luminance level for your assessment. Take a look at this. This is a typical office workspace. You have around close to 150 lux on your keypad, much lower somewhere around 30 lux in your rear side of your computer. There is a window glazing here. So, you get close to 250-300 lux here. On your notice board, you will get somewhere around 80 lux. When you just lift your eyes, you look at the window, you will be getting close to 3000 lux at some instance. So, your eye is now exposed to a variety of illuminance level as well as if you take a look, each of these surfaces have different reflectances. Take the ceiling take the notice board, take the keyboard, take a sheet of paper plus you have your glass surfaces plus you have papers, you know light dark surfaces where your brightness levels also now are typically varying. If these say for example, the task versus background, the brightness is very high. Say if, if you are look, you know, locating your computer towards this side, when you look at the screen, the light levels are much low, the brightness is different. Moment you turn out, you see the large pane window, then you have a different light level. If this is too different, you know, if the, the difference is too high, then you will have a visual discomfort. Similarly, if you are turning the computer to this side, there is a direct light which is falling, you have a reflection of the window, you have the direct, you know, visible light getting reflected from your computer screen. Again, this will result in glare. So, these are typical do's and don'ts are typical instances which I is exposed to. You can do a mapping space to space. Here, this is what we were talking about. If we really want to save energy, if we are really conscious about it, say in a typical open office like this, if you simply go with a ceiling lights, which is a common thing to do, you have ceiling lights all around. You will have, if I am wanting to ensure something like 200 lux in this particular plane, I will have to increase these luminars, the lux levels are the number of luminan, lumens, you know, luminars which are placed in the ceiling, the numbers have to be increased so that I will get around 200 lux on my tabletop. The other better idea or a more, you know, logical idea here is to go for task lighting for each of these tables or at least four of these cubicles, you have one task lighting, one light separately. Whenever these people are out, these lights can be turned off, whereas the background lighting can just be around 100-150 lux, so as to ensure clear visibility of objects. Other than this, you now we talked about illuminance, luminance and glare. Other than this, we have few other parameters, spectral energy distribution at which part the light energy is distributed along the spectrum. Then you have something called color temperature and color rendering. These are typically used in interior lightings. For example, Imagine you are going to a jewellery shop, you have a gold section, gold jewellery, you have a diamond jewellery, you have a silver jewellery. Each of these jewellery has a typical color, gold has you know, a typical yellowish tint, <coughs> whereas diamond more crystal kind of thing, you want a different kind of light for the jewellery to be more appealing to the eye. Yes, if you put it in natural light, if you bring it out, show it in the natural light, it will show the actual color. Whereas, what the sellers do, they try to enhance the look and feel of it, similar to a silk shari shop. If you have to really enhance the particular project, you know, product which is being sold, they will have a kind of color rendering, which we call color rendering. The color of the light is so adjusted that a particular product is more enhanced in its look and feel. Then, with modern lighting like LEDs, we have a phenomenon called flicker, the rate of, you know, flickering. There are devices to measure flicker rates. Flickering is another important phenomena which affects the health of the eye as well as the visibility and visual comfort. So, flicker is another important phenomenon, but primarily as far as this module is concerned, we are limiting ourselves to illuminance, luminance and 
glare. As we know daylight is very important, one of the studies which I am referring to, this is a study which was done some time back in Canada, where they identified two different you know benefits of daylight. First thing of course we know, it reduces the artificial lighting load. First is it directly reduces the plug load or the light load associated, the electricity consumption for artificial lighting. Apart from this, it also reduces the heat generated from these lighting. So, apparently reducing the cooling load of the system. So, both these cases you have considerable cost saving. Apart from this, they also found that it improved the quality of the space, it improved the productivity of the workers, then it also improved the saleability it improved the health and comfort indoors. Finally, they resulted, you know, they perceived a result of better labor and cost saving apart from an increased sale of a particular product which are, you know, which was there. Now, let us to take a step by step look at how daylighting is, you know, can be understood and how we can design for daylighting. The first thing we should know is what is available to us, how much amount of light at all visible light is available to us. This depends on where exactly you are. If you are in the equator, you will have really high amount of light level. We typically refer this as design sky illuminance. It is not, you know, just putting the sensor directly below the sun and measuring it. Like I said, you will have, you know, close to 1 lakh lux if you are putting a sensor and measuring. But this is something like what you will get from 9 am to 5 pm at least for 85 percent of the time. So, even if you are measuring on a western facade in the mornings or eastern facade in the evening, you should be able to get this amount of light. That is what we refer as design sky illuminance. That is a minimum best available lighting, visible light available on a particular location. It varies from equator, it is very high, it can be around as high as 18,000 lux. As you go further, you have around 3000 lux in your polar region. What we have to understand? If you are providing a window, say for example, a 2 meter by 1 meter window, you will get more than enough daylight for example, for a small room, say 3 meter by 3 meter room with 2 meter by 1 meter window on one side, you may get more than enough daylighting if the building is located in equator, whereas the same building if you are designing close to the poles, the available light itself is much lesser. So, you may not be able to ensure the minimum amount of daylight which is required. For example, when a standard says you should have at least 200 lux daylight available, you may not be able to achieve it with the same design both in equator as well as in the polar regions because the available daylight or the design sky illuminance varies. We are somewhere here as I said close to you know crisscrossing tropic of cancer. In India, we take the design sky illuminance as 8000 lux. Some of the standards references, they also consider 8500. Typically, we take national code suggests around 8000 lux as design sky illuminance. So, first step when we are starting to do daylighting design, we will take 8000 lux as available to us outside the window. One of the main factors primarily which is talked about is daylight factor. It is expressed in percentage, it is a unit expressed in percentage. It is nothing but the ratio of illumination which is available indoor to that of what is available outdoor. So, when I said 8000 lux is a standard design sky or what is available standard design sky illuminance which is available outside my window if I am located in India. If I am able to ensure say 80 lux which means I have 1 percent daylight factor. This is as simple as that. So, when, I st when a standard says you ensure at least 2 percent daylight factor, it is ideally meaning that average illuminance in your room, average illuminance I am talking about, it can be more close to the window, it can be further less in the interiors, but overall average daylight available inside the room should be 160 lux. So, without any artificial lighting, you should be ensure you should be able to ensure 160 lux from just daylighting. So, you have to size your windows appropriately in order to get this. This is what is a simple definition of daylight factor. Of course, it indicates the effectiveness of building design in harvesting or harnessing natural lighting. Apart from the direct component, we have been talking about the design sky illuminance which is available. This is a direct component. If this much is available, this is getting indoor. Apart from that, there are two important parameters which affect the daylight into the building. First thing is an external reflected component and second is internal reflected component. 
imagine you have a snow cover or imagine you have a water body or imagine you have a grass surface each of these surfaces i am talking about have a specific absorption and reflection characteristics so when you have a grass surface or you have an empty terrain a dark black soil versus a snow clad area the snow would reflect more amount of light so the direct light apart from entering your window it also falls on these surfaces gets reflected so external reflected component in the case of snow you might get more whereas in the case of dark wet black soil you might get much less external reflected component the second thing is the internal reflected component what if you paint your ceiling totally black once you have a direct light hitting a particular surface the second reflection third reflection will be almost nullified because after the first reflection your black surfaces are going to absorb not much reflect this light whereas if you have more reflecting surfaces it will help you or it will enhance the throw of daylight far into the interior so your overall lighting level will be considerably high if your internal reflected components are higher so there are three components here direct component plus external reflected component plus internal reflected component three important parameters are associated if you have to measure it take a sensor put one out and one in you measure this measure this you can simply get the ratio to find out what is the daylight factor if you take a look at national building code or sp32 which is again associated standard with national building code you will find the use of nomograms extensively you have you know a method called lux grid method which you can use to determine what is the daylight factor there are nomograms nicely which you know seamlessly helps you to find out what would be the external reflected component what is the effect of obstructions outside what is the effect of internal reflected component with these things how do i design or how do i size my window this is much easily presented in our national code you will have like lux level specification you will also find some specifications relating to required daylight factors instead of saying this much lux or daylight levels are required people might say for example corridors you need 0.5% daylight factor whereas lobbies lounges you will need 1% so if you are if this standard in case if the standard is applicable in india you will have to ensure at least 40 lux of daylight available in these spaces because we have 8000 lux as your ambient here you will have 80 lux this will be 120 lux and further high around 400 lux here for the laboratories so this is what the translation means now we have been talking about lux levels daylight factors external and internal reflected component these are for open window moment you have glass or glazing system third factor you know the fourth factor comes into picture that is the effect of glass itself we refer it to visible light transmittance in the heat you know thermal section we talked about something called solar heat gain coefficient or shgc this is for heat we talked about shgc here for light we are talking about vlt that is visible light transmittance this is expressed in percentage how much amount of the incident light is able to be passed through a particular glass for example if you are taking a single clear glass a single clear glass if you are taking as a example this will have a visible light transmittance of something close to say 90% or let us take 85% vlt is available same shgc will be really high it will be around 0.8 to 0.9 it allows high amount of heat to pass through it also allows high amount of the light daylight to pass through say you know 20 years back when energy conservation and energy conscious design were started to be you know buzzwords people started realizing the need for it they started going for double glass window of course then they started going in for dark tinted windows so that they can cut solar radiation so in this context for example if you take a dark tinted a bronze tinted window you will have an shgc of something like 0.5 a double glass with a bronze tint you will be able to achieve a solar heat gain coefficient of 0.5 which means you are able to cut almost half of the radiative component as well as the conductive component shgcs drastically come down so you are able to naturally save some energy there but what is the impact on vlt vlt will be as low as 0.2 or 20 percentage 
the visible light available is drastically cut. This is going to increase your lighting energy, lighting electrical energy. This was a negative impact with the new things called spectrally selective glazing or low E coated glass, typically called low E coated glass. These are spectrally selective. If you recollect, we saw different spectrums of the electromagnetic rays. One we are talking about is visible spectrum here. Here we are talking about the infrared spectrum. These spectrally selective glazing will permit the visible light to pass through while they will cut down the infrared, especially the short wave solar radiation to be cut through. So, if you take a low E double glass, low E coated, even a plain glass, there are you know even planetum or plain kind of glass which are available, which are good in thermal. In those glasses, you will find SHGC as low as 0.15 versus VLT of the order of say 40 to 50 percent, which means they are allowing 50 percent of daylight to come in while SHGC is drastically cut down. You are saving energy as far thermal is concerned you are also able to manage enough amount of daylight for your interior. So, that the artificial lighting energy, electrical energy consumption is cut down. So, this is a crucial thing you have to keep in mind when you are designing your windows as well as glazing system. Take care of SHGC for energy conservation, whereas also take care of <coughs> the visible light transmission property of the glass, uh, glass or glazing system, so that your lighting loads can be brought down. There is a simple indicator for this, which is called light to solar gain ratio, which is nothing but VLT by SHGC, that is a ratio which indicates a higher light to solar gain ratio means the light transmittance is also better. So, this is SHGC versus VLT relationship. So, as far this module is concerned, we have talked about, we have introduced the concept of light and various indices used for measuring it. We talked about illuminance, luminance, we talked about luminous flux, lumens, then we talked about luminous intensity, we talked about glare. Apart from that, we looked at what is daylight, what are the parameters associated with daylighting design, what is daylight factor and we finally looked at what is the impact of glass and glazing system on the available daylight inside a building. Thank you.